Thank you very much, Nico. Hello, everybody. I hope you are having a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, whatever it is for you. My name is Catalyst, and I'm joined by two absolutely handsome gentlemen. On my right is... John Di San Donato. I'm also a runner of this game. And to my left is... Nubus. Also not a runner of this game, but <laughs> I know the game run pretty well. He, he played it, okay? So <laughs> let, uh, that's I played it good at least enough. once. Yeah, at least once. Same here. Um, I don't believe we had a, an incentive for a name. I might be wrong, Nico, if, if you can check, because I don't remember. There doesn't appear to be a name incentive, only the ending choice. Right, well, that's the main one anyway, so I'm going to call myself GigaChat because I need to compensate for something. I'm going to start as Astrologer, I'm going to start with the Lands Between rune, and then, you know, take it to the next level with the compensation and actually become a real GigaChad. Um, yeah, so timer's going to start when I uh, skip the first cutscene. I should probably click the button, which I will. And yeah, this is going to be Elden Ring All Remembrances. First, the game, you know, starts with a nice loading screen. Then you skip the cutscene when it starts. There we go. Timer starts. And we start the run with a 15 second black screen because this is uh, what hype looks like. This is high quality from software programming. Anyway, we're in the game. Elden Ring All Remembrances. Let's get this. So first thing I do, I already did a small trick actually on the way. I pick up the first finger, that is important because you cannot open the doors otherwise, so you need to pick up your finger from the dead maiden. And then I immediately was blocking, and blocking basically cancelled the pickup animation, so I was able to start sprinting a little bit sooner, which is, uh, which is quite nice. So here's the first boss, he jumps in, and for some reason they like learned from Sekiro, and they were like, let's make a first boss where it doesn't matter if you kill him or not, so boss jumps in, and I jump out, and bye. And I'm dead, which is fine. We're gonna die a couple of times on purpose in this run, and this was the first death. Um, so if you are hoping for a deathless run, I'm sorry to disappoint you quite early. And we're gonna spawn in the cave here, in the stranded graveyard. I totally didn't have to wait for it to pop up to know the name of the area. And we are given two familiar items. That's the Flask of Crimson Tears and Flask of Ceruleran Tears, also known as, you know, the Estus Flask. Um, for most people that have played these games before by From Software, that's obviously Dark Souls and Bloodborne and, and Demon Souls. This game shares a lot of similar mechanics. Today's leg day, so we do squats. That's how it has to be. I mean, you know, you gotta... Keep this exercise. Yeah, exactly. You gotta maintain the physique somehow. I just got out of the buffet here and I had a pretty big dinner, so... Got to make sure I put the nutrients to good use. Anyway, we enter the overworld. Uh, the game is basically segmented into several over overworld areas, uh, combined with legacy dungeons, which are kind of closed off areas with uh, main bosses. I go ahead and light the first grace. Uh, that's the equivalent of a bonfire in this game. That's because I'm going to come back later. If you don't know what graces and bonfires do, they essentially serve as your last checkpoint, and you can also fast travel to them. Fast travel in this game is available basically right from the start through the map. Um, so I'll be using that quite a bit, and I'll actually be abusing that for some glitches later on as well. Now, just to briefly mention what this category is about, it's called All Remembrances. Remembrances in this game are essentially the equivalents of boss souls. There's uh, 15 bosses that drop a remembrance, and you can turn the remembrance into either runes as a currency, from which you can level up, or you can purchase items and whatnot, or you can also trade them for some specific boss uh, weapons or boss items. So it's, it's kind of like boss souls in, in Dark Souls. And we got to obtain all of them and then reach the credits and, and finish the game. So like I said, there's 15 of them, but there's also going to be some other boss fights that I have to do, which are um, mandatory in order to get to those, to, those man, uh, to those remembrance bosses anyways. Here I'm going to reach a second grace. This one I'm going to light up because Melina is going to show up. So we are maidenless, but obviously the Giga Chat we are, we're not going to be maidenless for too long. So she's going to show up, and she's going to give me the strongest item in the game, which is the horse. And you'll see why. I'm going to accept her accord. Even though with the current gas prices, it's not probably a really good idea, but yeah. This is uh, all bio, it's fine. European Union Green Deal confirmed and approved. So now we have a horse, which is quite nice, because I can run faster. You also notice there's three bars on the top left. Right now, the green one started uh, depleting. That's the stamina bar. You need stamina to perform any action in the game. 
And what's cool about this game, because there's a lot of running around, uh, when you're outside of combat, the stamina doesn't deplete. I just, you know, engage the enemy, so it does now. And the other ones are mana and, and health, basically, or health and focus points. So right here, I'm going to pick up another Grace. This one is really crucial, because I have to come back here later, and I'll be using it for a glitch as well, like one of the bread and butter glitches. On the way, you also saw me pick up a Golden Seed. Golden Seeds allow me to increase the charges of my flasks, so that means I can heal uh, a couple more times. That comes in handy later, because I'll be uh, juggling both the health and the focus point resources. And speaking of bread and butter glitches, I'm going to perform the first one here. Uh, I'll be abusing this a lot throughout the run, and it's called Pegasus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump off the horse, and I'm going to quit out as I do it. But I don't want to quit out too soon, otherwise the game's not going to register me quitting out. And I don't want to quit out too late, otherwise uh, the horse is going to disappear. However, there's a, basically, at some point there was a cut mechanic where you could just summon the horse next to you. And this is a way to actually kind of reactivate that, right? So the horse is here, and then I'm going to get to this, to this edge. I'm going to walk off. Well, that was really fast, actually. Well, that was not a planned death, but that's okay. I have a grace that, like, is right next to it. So for some reason, I fell off super, super fast. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yes, Same. that is super gravity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, at least I'll have a bit more time to explain it. So, yeah, the horse ends up being next to me which is really useful because I can just walk off of a platform in a specific way. And if I do it correctly and don't die, then the horse is going to spawn at the edge and fall instead. And that is really, really good because if there's a death plane underneath me and I send Torrent, that's the horse's name, I send him through the death plane, then something magical is kind of going to happen. So we're going to do the quit out again. Yeah, it uh, makes the quit out look easy, but it does take quite quick inputs at first. Like Once you get used to it, it gets much easier, but you can still fail it. Yeah, it's kind of like practicing a, a combo in a fighting game or something. Okay, so there we go. We actually had normal gravity this time. I'm going to quit out. And let's see how the horse is going to fall down. Don't call Peter. See, the horse is gone. Then I'm going to jump down here, and I can actually resummon the horse by just sacrificing one charge of my Estus Flask, or, you know, of my Flask of Crimson Tears. And then this happens. So now we are flying and this is uh yeah this this is nice because it cuts off a lot of the running that you have to do in the run except there's still a lot of running and uh you're gonna see that in the next like five minutes which is a great opportunity to explain what's actually happening so what we did like i said we basically threw torrent through a kill plane and whenever something dies in dark souls or like bloodborne or even in elden ring uh by falling through a kill plane, the game disables its gravity. And that's usually no problem, because if the player dies to the kill plane, well, they go to their last grace, and, you know, everything is reset back to normal. Um, if an enemy dies to a kill plane, well, the only way to, like, respawn the enemy is to reset the entire area. But if the, if the horse goes through the kill plane, then you can just respawn it later uh, by sacrificing that one flask charge. And, uh, yeah, now you can fly. Also, uh, here's a balloon, and it's gone. So, <laughs> I can imagine a lot of ways to like kill flying balloons, but um, flying around on a horse and, and slashing it with a sword melee, I don't think Miyazaki envisioned that. Or maybe he did, like, I, I don't know. He does have a special talent of kind of anticipating what the speedrunners are gonna do. Or, so... Or getting rid of trees that they use. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, like, in this game, a lot of the patches that have come out, uh, they kind of focused on, like, what the speedrunners have been doing when it comes to even, like, small sequence breaks and whatnot. So they uh, started messing around with collision in some areas just to prevent us from doing some sequence breaks. But we found new ways to do them, so get wrecked. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm going to be running towards this Divine Tower of Lyurnia. That's because there's a quest item there. Normally, you're supposed to do this convoluted uh, quest with Rani the Witch. And at the end of... Well, it's not at the end, but during the quest, you're going to gain access to a Remembrance boss. Um, but the items that you can pick up during that quest line, they lay there anyway. Like, there are no checks for it. So I'm going to go ahead and utilize the Flying Horse right from the get-go here and get on the Divine Tower and in order to pick up the Curse Mark of Death and then... Way later on in the run, it will allow me to get to Lich Dragon 40 sacks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and touch this pillar. This makes sure that the next area is going to load properly and avoid this pillar here. Otherwise, it's going to deload. And I have to point out, and you're going to see it in action in just a second, that gaining height while you have no gravity is pretty easy because simply you can just kind of like scale up 
uh, you know, collision. But losing height is a little bit more problematic. Most of the time, and you saw me do it earlier when I was getting that grace that I'll be using later, uh, I'm going to try to jump. But the problem is that if you jump and you are way too far away from flat ground, you're just going to be suspended in the air and then... Uh, you're either going to die to a full timer, which is 12 seconds, or you're going to have to quit out to return back to your last stored position, which might be a long time ago. So as you can see, like scaling up this rock is not really that big of a deal, except for this one part here that can be a little bit finicky. There we go. And I'm going to make sure to get enough height to get on the bridge, but not too much height to uh, not be able to touch flat ground after a jump. Otherwise, like I said, I would be suspended in the air. I'm going to go ahead and push open this... Big door. This is upper body workout now. Pecs are being worked here. Very nice. And another thing that is really important is when you have Pegasus activated, you can actually just hop on Torrent and then use him in areas... Okay, this button can be kind of memey. Let me try and activate it. There we go. Oh, no. Okay, well, the elevator just left without me. Well, that's... Uh, um, that's nice. Well, bye, I guess. I'm gonna hop off torrents and uh, where, where's the lever for this actually? Um, great question. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I, I've never actually seen this. So the problem with the button sometimes. Okay, I don't actually see the lever. That's not good. Is it up behind you? Might be some. Oh, oh there's a the button, button here. Yeah, there oh. we go. Yeah, I've played this game once or twice, but that, that's about it. But the thing is, even if you played this game like 15 times, you might never go down this elevator ever. <laughs> yep. So, the button can be kind of weird when I'm on Pegasus, and uh, you basically can activate it by sort of like sprinting and stopping over it, and yeah, I kind of overdid it and left the elevator. So hopefully the button's gonna activate now. Um, any day it's gonna get to the bottom. This is kind of like the RNG that you play here at the SA when you're waiting for the elevators. Should we get a donation in whilst waiting for this elevator? Oh yeah, for sure. Alright, $50 from Heisenberg. That says, this donation times 100. Is the number of deaths I had in Elder Ring. So I, I did the maths, it's 5,000 times. <laughs> and that's going towards Rani's ending, and that is in the lead right now with $275 with Frenzy Flame at 215 You guys have still got time to choose the ending of choice. Go check the bids and put some money towards it. Thank you for the generous donation. So as I was saying, the good thing about having Pegasus activated is that in areas such as this, where you're not supposed to be on the horse, like the game forces you off the horse, same thing in Legacy Dungeons, for example. Um, if you have Pegasus active, it doesn't do that. So I can just keep the horse up here, pick up the curse mark, and then return to my uh, last race. What I did on the elevator is I just favorited the Stormhill Shack race that I picked up earlier. That will allow me to uh, uh, select it really quickly from the map menu. And uh, then I also popped the two runes that I, the one that I started with and the one that I got from the balloon. So now I have 5,000 runes, I'll be able to level up some strength, I'll be able to purchase some items, I'll talk about the items a little bit later and what I need them for. That's because I'll be doing another very important glitch in this run and that is the wrong warp. So after I purchase the items, I'm going to use the item Memory of Grace, which is the Dark Sign equivalent. It returns you to the last grace that you rested at and dep depletes all of your runes that you have left, the currency. So let me get 10 strength here. And then as that warp is activated, I'm gonna activate a simultaneous warp to the last grace that, um, that I had before the, before the round table hold here. So shield, scimitar, bell, wolves, use the item. And then I warp, like at the end of the first warp, I warp to this other grace. And what ends up happening is basically, Two warps are overlapped, and you saw that I just spawned like somewhere else in midair. That is because the game loses track of... Uh, there are two variables, essentially. And the game loses track of which spawn point to use. It knows which area to transport me to, which is the second... Uh, or, or like the bonfire, or I should say grace, that I select from the map. It transports me to that area, but it loses track of which spawn point to use. So it goes through a failsafe routine, essentially, and defaults to the first one on the list. And the first ones on the list are what we call default position. And obviously where the developers put the first one on the list, the first spawn point, that's going to determine whether wrong warps in that area are beneficial or not. And that one actually did put me a little bit closer to that, to that uh, teleport in the purified, uh, purified runes, which allowed me to get to the bottom of the, uh, of the La Raya Lucaria Academy, which is the first legacy dungeon we'll be entering, but not the first legacy dungeon we'll be clearing. 
and uh, you'll see that later why. But the thing is that the gate is closed, so what I have to do is I go have to get a key. Now, the key is not very well hidden. It's uh, basically right next to the entrance. There's like a little map that you can pick up and it's supposed to be this like, oh wow, you know, moment where you figure out where the key is. But yeah, it's, it's actually pretty close. However, I take a small detour. I go to the temple quarter here and I take this grace for way later on in the run. I'll have to be coming back for a specific boss. So I go ahead and, and take this one. And then I'm going to head towards Smarag, who's a dragon guarding the key. And, and we're going to activate an epic boss fight, except uh, maybe not. He's so, a sleepy dragon. Yeah, he, is a, he, he, he looks like me when I left the buffet just, you know, 30 minutes ago. Uh, quite sleepy in food coma indeed. Anyway, so what I do here is I quit out. And quit outs in this game, what they also do is they default position to their, or I should say default enemies to their original initial positions. And also, like, they basically kill combat. So I'm able to just go get the key, yonk the key, and then warp away. Normally in combat, you're not able to open the map, you're not able to warp. But because I quit out and I reset the enemy to, you know, its default state, I was able to just get the hell out of here. So this was the gate that was original sealed. I just opened it with the with the uh, Glenstone Academy key. And I'm gonna go ahead and pick up this Grace because I'll be revisiting this area several times, actually. But I'm not gonna head to Renala, the boss of this area, simply because I do not really have anything to fight her with. I, you know, I still have just my starting items, nothing else. So I'm gonna set up Pegasus here instead. And uh, instead of going through the Academy regularly, I'm gonna go ahead and use the Flying Horse in order to, uh, you know, cut down on some running and the goal is basically right now to uh, get to Volcano Manor and the fastest way to do that is through Raya Lucaria so there's a second quit out this one's to throw the horse off the platform hopefully everything works out fine and in the Volcano Manor the reason I want to go there is because there's Rykard that's the main boss of that dungeon Right, and for right card, um, there's basically a scripted weapon that you're or, right. There's a kind of a gimmicky fight that you're supposed to do with a scripted weapon, uh, the Serpent Hunter, and you don't really need any levels for that. You can just you know go ahead and kill the boss without any levels. It's just a little bit risky because I I can get one shot by like anything, but it is the best way to get a lot of runes early. I get 180k overall, and that allows me to go ahead and get my early level ups for uh, the Sword of Night and Flame, which will be the weapon used throughout this run. So what you saw me do there is I made sure to load the uh, load this area as late as possible so I can catch the water wheel cycle. And here I'm going to get grabbed. It's not a scripted death. And uh, this is because essentially what happens is you get trapped in this virgin abductor, but... As I always say, for a Giga Chat such as ourselves, uh, such abduction is not going to work, obviously. So what ends up happening is we get transported to the Volcano Manor, sort of to the place where um, these Iron Maidens are discarded to. So Normally, um, you're supposed to go to the left. Let me actually equip my armor. But you can jump down here, survive this fall, get through the lava, because the lava actually doesn't deal as much damage. And now I'm basically in the Volcano Manor proper, um, just inside of the Legacy Dungeon. And what's also really nice is that the, the town area down here has items. And these items are called Smithing Stones. And Smithing Stones are weapon uh, upgrades. Or rather, I should say they are materials that you can upgrade your weapons with. And these ones are Somber Smithing Stones, level 6. And I'm also going to pick up level 5 and level 7. And the difference between regular smithing stones and the somber ones are that somber smithing stones are used for, like, special weapons that have original skills on them. And the main thing is that they only go to plus 10, and you only need to use one smithing stone per level. Regular uh, weapons go all the way to plus 25, and you need to use, like, several smithing stones in order to ascend one level. So this way we can get a max level weapon, like, very quickly. Or close to max level anyway. So here's the somber smithing stone 5. I'm still doing that trick where I'm blocking as I pick up the item in order to uh, cancel the pickup animation. Here's a noble, he misses. Another cool thing about this game is that you do have a dedicated jump button, which does add a lot of vertical mobility to us, uh, which is really, really nice. And we're going to put it to good use right here, doing a pretty small looking skip, but it actually skips running around almost the entire manor. So I'm going to jump on this knob. 
Jump up here. Very nice. Get the Stomper Smithing Stone plus seven. That jump is actually harder than it looks because you essentially kind of need to only judge your horizontal distance, not vertical, because you always kind of pop up to that platform. Um, but if you jump too early, um, then, yeah, you're not going to make it. So one trick that you see me do here as well, as I'm picking up the Royal Knight's Resolve Ash of War, is crouching uh, while I'm sprinting. That is because it is a little bit quicker than regenerating stamina by just stopping the sprint and then, you know, starting to sprint again. Here I'm going to rest at this grace. This is because I'm in a trapped state. Uh, after I got abducted by the Iron Maiden, I cannot warp now until I... Uh, until I rest at a grace. I'm gonna go ahead and use the memory of grace, and then I'm gonna warp to the Stormhill Shack. You're gonna see what happens now, is I'm gonna spawn out of bounds. That's a, that is because the default position for this specific grace is misplaced and it's under the map. Now, what happens here is the game has no stored position in this area for me. So when I quit out and reload, it puts me back to the area where I had a stored position, which is the Volcano Manor, but it loses track of where to spawn me again and defaults to the first place on the list. So you see that I spawn in front of the Volcano Manor. This is really important because it allows me to essentially perform wrong warps in areas that I cannot warp to, right? The first wrong warp that I did, I only did it because I warped to a specific grace. This way of wrong warping, I can perform in any area. It doesn't need to have a grace. So that's really convenient because there are only, you know, a couple of spots, or I should say a couple of places around the, around the map where wrong warping is beneficial, and even like less of those places have a grace. So this way, I combine two different wrong warps, and I'm able to wrong warp in any area of the game. Uh, right after that, you see me set up another Pegasus, and we're going to be heading towards uh, Yabo Ricardo, as I like to call him, uh, or Rikard, in, um, in, you know, most normal circles. And uh, while I do that, we have time for a donation or two. Absolutely, we've got a good few donations coming through. We've got a $5 anonymous donation going towards the Frenzied Flame ending. And then another 100 anonymous dollar donation going to the language choice of German for Sekiro Shadows Die Twice Randomizer. We've also got a $20 donation from Hermit going towards Rani's ending also. Uh, one last one for me, a $50 yeah. donation from Boogie Poppy. This is... Where have you been hiding? I took you for dead. <laughs> no matter, it's all the same. Lay out your donations then. And that's going towards Arkix Cursed Sonic Costume. Thank you very much for those donations. Back to you. Thank you very much for the generous donation. So this is Rikard. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to equip the Serpent Hunter. And essentially, I will spam jump R2s on him. That's the fastest way to uh, get a lot of DPS in. I'm going to follow it up by L2, which is a special attack that's going to stagger him. And I'm going to follow that up with another L2, which is an uppercut. Then I'm going to follow it with another jumping R2. And I'm going to get a grab attack. I'm going to roll it to the left to do another jumping R2. Now I'm going to try to bait out a melee attack by going closer and then walk back to get out of range and punish it with a jump. One more for the stagger. During the stagger, I'm going to do another jump R2 and then an L2, which is going to allow me to do another jumping R2. Because I have enough time to go ahead and uh, still dodge whatever might be coming next. So here's the poison spit. That's kind of an annoying attack, but it's fine. Okay, let's see what the Serpent's gonna do. I don't want to do, like, anything risky. Another grab, roll it to the side, and then try to bait out these melee attacks while walking backwards. Uh, there's something behind me. As you can see, the camera's not liking it. That was kind of close, but he missed. So that's phase one. And now the more difficult phase is coming up. So Rikard himself basically has certain combos that progress the Inferno phase. And the Inferno phase means that if he reaches it, he's just going to start summoning skulls everywhere. And I'm going to have to like run around for like 30 seconds trying to dodge everything. So here I actually got a skull attack as well, but I'm going to interrupt it with an L2 on reaction. And follow up with an R2. Let's see what he does. So that's not a combo that would progress Inferno phase. So that's good RNG already. Do a jump R2 to punish it. See what it does. Just a quick R1 before he finished that attack. This is going to progress the Inferno phase. So notice how the sky is going to change. Actually, I think I interrupted it before he finished the combo. I'm not quite sure. Let's see. No, the sky is a little bit redder, as you can see. So that means one more combo that progresses Inferno phase. And... Uh, 
He'll do skulls, but he's low enough already that it shouldn't really matter. And he's doing another decent attack. So just dodge that, do jump R2, wait for another one. And as you can see, I'm also abusing the fact that I can like jump over some of his attacks. And here's another stagger. Now you can see everything is really red. That means that he would start summoning skulls, but it doesn't matter because he's dead. Nice. Cool. We could have only done this together. <laughs> All right. So um, that was the right card. I'm glad that um, I managed to get him first try, but we didn't get to hear the line. You're going to have to deal with just my bad imitation. So right from here, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the main academy gate, as you can see. I'm going to set up Pegasus again, but I'm still not going to go to the Volcano Manor. Uh, sorry, to the Raya Lucaria Academy, because in with the Serpent Hunter, as good as the weapon actually is, like if you haven't followed Elden Ring speedruns, the, the weapon that we picked up is actually like one of the best weapons in the game. And it has no level requirements, so it's like really good for rune level 1 runs where you don't level up. And it's like really good for just regular glitchless runs as well. Uh, for, for glitched runs, we have some other strats, but you actually use the Serpent Hunter as well, just in a different way. Um, instead, what I'm going to do, instead of going to the Academy, I'm going to head backwards with the Flying Horse to the Four Belfries. This is because the Four Belfries are basically these towers that have teleporters at them. And these teleporters are supposed to kind of like serve as preview areas for some of the later game areas. But as you know... We have the wrong warp, so we can abuse that quite heavily. You're going to see that a little bit later. And another reason I want to get the four Belfries Grace is because I'm going to wrong warp to it in a bit. And that's going to take me closer to the NPC Ichi, who's a blacksmith. And he's going to be able to upgrade my weapon once I get it. And uh, most importantly, he also sells some of the lower level smithing stones. So I'll be able to buy them and then uh, get my Sword of Night and Flame all the way to plus seven. I'm going to try to do a little cheeky jump here, get on the chest and uh, cancel the animation of opening it up so I can pick up the item a little bit quicker. I'm going to jump down here, and another little thing is I light the grace when facing away from it, and that way I get a turnaround animation. During that turnaround animation, I can actually open the map, which you're not supposed to be able to uh, when lighting a grace, and then I can warp a little bit sooner than, you know, uh, having to wait out for the grace lighting animation to finish. So just very small time save. So here I come back to the Stormhill Shack. This is because I'm going to go ahead and go to the Warmaster's Shack just over here. And this normally has the NPC Burnout, but if you never interact with him and you kill Rykard, he dies. And that is nice because uh, he has the Devour Scepter. And the Devour Scepter is going to be a weapon that I use for a glitch later on. Very important uh, skip that we'll be performing. But there are a couple of pieces that need to be kind of put together first, as a, almost as a puzzle. And the Devour Scepter is the first one of those. And the routing kind of operates around it as well, but I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Then from there, I'm going to go ahead and go to Kaelid. The fastest way to get to Kaelid is to just get trapped here um, under the uh, Agil Dragon Ruins, basically. Um, Dragonburn Ruins, yeah, that's the name. Thank you. And I'm going to get transported to the Celia uh, Crystal Tunnel. And these rats can be a little bit of a nuisance, so hopefully they don't block me. That's step one, and hopefully they don't kill me as I'm getting transported. Okay, I've got to jump, so we should be out of range. It's very nice. So from here, um, I'm heading over here because there's a boss in this area called Radan, and I have to fight him way later on. But what I can do is I can pick up some items on the way that I can utilize, so that's why I go here pretty early. Also, load it, longest loading screen in the whole run, pretty much. Um... And yeah, as I'm going to make my you know, way through the tunnel, I think right now we have a time for a donation or two again. Sorry, did you just throw it over to me there? Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, Nico. thank you. Like, <laughs> I was just in the midst of, a, of uh, something else there. So, shall I give, do some donations then? We've got a $50 donation from Helmet that says, Didn't expect Pegasus. Therefore, offer charity and praise the message. Thank you, Helmet, for the $50 donation. And Steve Cook does a $15 donation saying, this game would make me smash my computer. So I won't try it. You look pretty good at it, though. 
and that goes towards the language choice for German. Now, let me see where that donation bid is out at the moment because there's been quite a few bids coming through for it for Sekiro. Uh, Shadows Die Twice, the randomizer. German is in the lead with $115 and Japanese still sitting at $50. So the Germans are coming through, reigning the lead over the language choice. Back to you. Thank you. While we are talking about languages, you saw me do some parkour there. I'm going some more parkour right here. Um, that was actually really smooth. Um, so w basically, there's a seal there down in, in the Celia town, and you can jump around it by, you know, doing some tricky horse parkour on the uh, on the branch there on the rocks. So here, what I pick up is the tear. I'll I'll explain what it does in a bit. I'm gonna rest at this grace because I'm in a trap state again after getting abducted by the chest, so, and because I'm gonna be wrong warping, I'm gonna go ahead and spend my uh, my runes here. So I level up basically stats that I need to be able to use the Sword of Night and Flame. Okay, and then I do this uh, map wrong warp again where I simply activate the Memory of Grace and then select another Grace from the map menu. And that's going to determine where I warped, but the spawn point is going to get corrupted because two warps are activated at the same time. So that's what we did there. And we are closer to Ichi. I'm going to go ahead and pop a Remembrance. So this Remembrance, I uh, transform into some runes. So I can go ahead and do some purchasing. And like I said, I'm going to need to get the Somber Smithing Stones here from Ichi. So this is really handy that the Remembrance essentially stays put in the inventory. Because like I said, a Wrong Warp uses the Memory of Grace and the Memory of Grace depletes me of my runes, so that's why I needed to spend them there and uh, keep the Remembrance and only pop it here on the way. I'm going to set up another Pegasus. That's because I'll be going to the Volcano uh, Carrier Manor. There's way too many manors in this game. How many times are you going to Volcano Manor? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not supposed to go there anymore. I don't know why my mind keeps on taking me back there. Probably because it's warm there. I like warm weather. You just like Rykar so much. And Rykar as well, yeah. I mean... Dead right card, good right card. So I'm going to take this grace because I'll be coming back later to upgrade my weapon as well. Once I uh, obtain the stronger somber smithing stones. But right now I can only uh, go ahead and get plus 7 after I do the purchase here. So I'm going to talk to him twice. Stand next to his mushroom because it's cute. Purchase the smithing stones and then head over to the... Not volcano, but carrier manor. Now, there's this... Uh, you know, trap here with uh, the spell and whatever. I don't really care about it too much. It's going to run to the side. And then the nice thing about this is that because I have Pegasus again, I can scale up this rock very easily. And instead of having to get into the manor and then run up to its upper floor and then drop into uh, a hidden kind of a basically closet sort of, I can just go ahead and abuse the fact that I'm flying and get to the closet immediately. Now, the closet is nice because in the closet... There's no Harry Potter, but there's the Sword of Night and Flame, which is a really, 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 really uh, strong weapon, and we'll be utilizing it as the main weapon for this run. I'm going to do the little trick with the chest again, uh, just for the sake of it, even though I probably lost time. There we go, got the weapon. Now I'm going to go back to the Roundtable Hold, which is the hub. And here I'm going to go ahead and do two things. I'm going to upgrade my weapon, finally. And I'm also going to apply the Royal Knight's Resolve that I picked up in the Volcano Manor. Uh, to the scimitar, which is really, really important to do. And I'll mention immediately why. So plus seven, get the Ash of War, and then I'm going to go ahead and go to Highway South. Um, you might remember I actually wrong warped onto this bonfire, onto this grace before. And I ended up close to the purified runes next to the teleporter. I'm going to spend the rest of my runes to get some uh, extra health. But what I can do is I can just run down here which enters another section of the map. You can imagine the map being basically um, kind of distributed between into different squares, and each square is going to have a different set of spawn points, so also a different default position. And the default position for this square is very convenient because it's right after the Stormrail Castle, which is the first uh, legacy dungeon you're supposed to go to. And that means that the boss of it is going to be very close when I'm going to be backtracking. So that is really, really convenient. But with the Royal Knight's Resolve, so what it's supposed to do is the weapon that you have it on, if you use that skill, it's supposed to boost its next attack by 80%, right? And then, like, it's supposed to either run out in 10 seconds or, like, 9 or whatever, or when you do an attack. 
However, because I'm going to apply it on my left hand, and then I'm going to unto hand, um, the buff will still be activated, and it will work for my right hand as well. But because I never attack with the left hand, it's not going to run out, even when I attack with the right hand. So that means I'm going to enjoy the 80% damage boost on the Sword of Night and Flame for the entire duration of 8 to 9 seconds, which is going to re result in something uh, yeah, quite, quite broken. We're going to get a lot of damage. You're going to see that in a bit. But what's more, because I have the scimitar, it's important that I use it on the scimitar because the scimitar has a dexterity requirement in order to wield it. You can see in the bottom left that it's crossed out. I cannot really wield the weapon because I do not have the necessary dexterity. That means when I use the Royal Knight's Resolve, the buff still gets applied. However, the FP that is normally used in order to apply it is not used. So I basically have a way to cast it for free as well. Which is like just too good to be true, and it's super nice because it allows me to uh, maintain more FP for my beams. Beams, well, there are two attacks that the Sword of Night and Flame can do. You basically activate a stance with L2, and then you either press R1, which is going to do a big beam, which you're going to see right now, or R2, which is like a flame attack, which I'm also going to use on some specific bosses. So what you see is RKR on two hands, and then I'm going to hit Godric so hard that his cape cannot handle it and stays suspended in the air like this. So, uh, yeah, it was... You can tell that was that was a pretty hard hit. Strong for capes. Yep. So I just warped to the wrong race, which is completely fine. I need to go to the four belfries here. Uh, so yeah, that was the first... Uh, well, second Remembrance boss that we, that we kill. Here at the grace, I'm gonna go ahead and spend the runes again. I'm gonna get one level of bigger. And then I'm going to use the golden seeds and also the tears that I picked up to boost up my, my flask. So as I mentioned before, the seeds allow me to get extra charges. And the tears that I picked up uh, allow me to increase its potency. So that means they're gonna, the flask charges are going to replenish more HP and more mana. Then I also spread the charges evenly, 3 and 3, so that I can also... So I can get health back, I can resummon the horse, and I can also get FP. So here I go ahead and uh, enter... The preview area of Nokron, but as soon as I enter Nokron, I can just go ahead and wrong warp. And the default position for Nokron is actually placed so conveniently that's right that it's right in front of the mimic fight that's in Nokron. Normally, you're only supposed to go to Nokron after you kill Radan, and killing Radan right now would not really be good because I'm not that powerful yet, contrary to uh, what Godric might tell you and his cape as well. So I'm gonna enter this uh, fantastic boss fight. Um, the game calls it a great enemy, so, uh, yeah, it has to be great, obviously, if the game says it. And bye. So, yeah, very, very good boss fights. Yeah, that's... I, I worked hard for that one, guys. So, that's a Mimic boss fight. Uh, I, I'm sure most people actually figured out that the Mimic essentially copies your gear, so if you unequip your stuff before you summon it, uh, it's just gonna appear naked. So the only thing that I left in my hand was the scimitar that I cannot use. So the mimic had no chance. And you saw the flame attack as well. It's nice because it covers a wider radius, wider area. So the beam, for example, it would be possible for the mimic to kind of dodge it. But with the flame, if timed properly, that doesn't really happen. So the reason I went to Nokron here um, is because I want to get to the capital. But the way to get to the capital it's a little bit convoluted through Altus Plateau, it takes some time. So what I want to do is I want to get through a teleporter here. And also, there's a Remembrance boss down here as well, which is the Regal Ancestor Spirit. So that's why I went to Nokron right now. Um, it's a little bit of a pain with this figure. Uh, as you can see, I don't have that much health. And it's a little bit of a pain with plus 7, because having extra damage would be quite nice, since there are some really annoying bosses coming up. But um, it's fine, we'll manage. So in order to go ahead and, and basically be evil and, and resummon the moose, I have to light up these fires first. And then I'm going to go ahead and immediately go and, and, and try and put it down. As I'm doing that, I think we have time to read a donation or two. Nico, take it away. The bid war for the ending choice is getting very, very toasty at the moment. Um, Stoldy99 donates $56 saying, Hey, Kata, good luck on the run. Let's get the Frenzy Flame ending and devour the world together. Together. Thank and you so much, Stoldy. That goes through the Frenzy Flame, which at the time of the donation, put Frenzy Flame $1 above Rani's ending. <laughs> However, Hermit donates $10 
throws it into Rani's ending, which means that the ending choice at the moment. Rani's ending is at $305. Friendly Flames at $296. It's getting very, very tight. Let's get some more donations in for these ending choices. Let's get this bid war going. Back to you. Thank you. So you guys have basically all the way until the end of the run to donate towards these endings. So uh, yeah, keep it going. Keep the bid war going. I love to hear it. I want to see Rani's ending, I will admit. Because uh, last time I did this at a marathon, we got the Frenzied Flame, so it would be nice to have a change. But what doesn't change is the game and this boss, which can be quite random. So we'll see what opening we get. There's three of them. One is really bad. The other two are pretty fine. So I'm going to approach the boss. I get the jump opener. I'm going to apply Archaea and run backwards, slightly to the right, in order to try and hit the head, which is its weak spot. I missed completely, which is fine. I'm going to walk backwards to not get hit by this. Do another beam. I don't have stamina to roll. I do have stamina to roll. Another beam. And that's nice. the spirit down. Okay, cool. So that could have been cleaner. I didn't get any of the extra hits to the head, which would have allowed me to deal more damage and potentially save a beam. But uh, what the boss can do is it can start teleporting away. And as it's teleporting away, uh, you cannot kill it during the animation. Where is it? There we go. You cannot kill it during that animation, so you just have to wait for it to teleport away and then run towards it and finish it off. So uh, it actually went really well there. Right afterwards, I'm going to get on the horse here and I'm going to set up another Pegasus and run towards maybe like one of the worst bosses in the game, essentially, which is the Valiant Gargoyles. Almost no matter like what route you do, they always find out some, some BS to kind of throw at you. So I had some really bad luck. And also bad skill earlier in practice, so I hope that I kind of took it out and I'll be able to uh, get rid of them. I have a cheeky little strategy that I'll be using. It should help with the first Gargoyle at least. And uh, we'll see after how it goes. So first flying horse, I'm going to replenish my FP. Then in order to lose some height, uh, besides just jumping, you can also use some like... Very specific collision, like for example this pillar, you can see that it's kind of angled, so I can run into it and lose a little bit of height. Which is good, because now I can clip through here and get into the Shifra Aqueduct. And I'm not supposed to be able to walk on the horse here, but like I mentioned earlier, I can do it because I have Pegasus activated, so the game doesn't force me off. I'm going to do some specific pathing, run to the middle of the room, like this, and then run towards this rock. Hopefully that's going to con uh, confuse the first Gargoyle. And I'm going to try to get on this rock instead. I need to make sure that I hop off in such a way that my character doesn't fall. Apply RKR and then beam it from up here. One, I'm going to walk slightly backwards to not slide down. Two, and you can see that the gargoyle is quite confused, which is good. So that's the first gargoyle. And now the second one. Apply RKR and let's see what it does. Nothing, so I'm going to hit it. Okay, that's not good. Okay. Dodged it, barely though. Yeah, that's super hard to dodge. Okay, I'm gonna try to stay close to get extra damage. That's just a jump that I can strafe. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. One more hit, dude. There we go. Okay, nice. <laughs> nice. They behaved. <laughs> yeah, they, that was They good. don't do that usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one thing I forgot to mention about the beam is that the closer I am to an enemy, the more damage I'm gonna deal. So that's why I try to like stay close to my enemies when I'm using the beam. And when Miyazaki kind of runs out of ideas of how to connect areas, he's like, come on, Tarnish, just get into this coffin. So we get into the coffin, slide down a river, and then, uh, yeah, I can go ahead and, and run through the deep root uh, depths here. The really cool thing about Pegasus is that it actually stays activated, as you can see, until you run through a loading screen. So that means even though I just went through the coffin, which, you know, it has loading there, but it, it loads during a black screen. There, there's no loading screen to be discovered. Uh, so that means that Pegasus is still activated even, even after I get transported here, which is really good because I can run towards my demise a little bit quicker because the upcoming boss fight is even worse than the Valiant Gargoyles. And uh, you'll see why. Anytime Miyazaki decides that it's a good idea to put NPC bosses into the game, it's always a terrible idea. So it's going to be Fias Champions. Normally this boss is supposed to, like, when you're playing online, what the boss is supposed to be, it's, like, fetching builds from other players, and so you're supposed to have, like, a little bit of a varied uh, experience or whatever. Because uh, I'm playing offline, you have to be playing offline when, when speedrunning 
Uh, the fight is always the same, but it's, yeah, it's quite a fiesta usually. So, yeah, let me get on the horse here. Because normally I cannot use it here, and as you can see, there's still quite a bit of running to do. Gonna hop off. And essentially what I'm gonna be faced with are three waves of enemies. The first two waves are just one enemy, and the third wave is three enemies at once. So I'm gonna get in range here, I'm gonna activate RKR. I'm gonna try to tap my flame so it hits just as soon as it spawns so that he runs into it. I'm gonna try to finish him off. There we go. I'm gonna summon the wolves, which is one of the other items that I purchased at the start of the run. And this is to split aggro later on. Now, second enemy is gonna spawn, which is Rogier. Again, try to tie my flame. Let's see if he runs into it. He didn't. Let's try it again. Okay, I hit him, which is nice. Wolves, keep him busy. Okay, he doesn't care about the wolves at all. Let's try to hit him with another flame. He missed again. Let's try another flame. Okay, Rogier is down, which is good. I'm gonna go ahead and replenish my FP, replenish HP, and now the worst part of the fight. So, as you're gonna see, three enemies spawning at the same time. I'm gonna try to position myself to hit all three of them, and let's see if that happens. So, I got a double hit, which is really good. Another nice. hit on Lionel, that's really good. And last, okay, he dodged, because of course he did. I didn't have stamina to roll there. I'm not gonna risk anything, I'm gonna go ahead and heal back up. I'm gonna reapply RKR and don't touch the last wolf, mate. Okay, there we go. That's Fias yes, Champions done. I've seen much worse. Yeah. It's very easy to see much worse than this. And I, you know, I saved one of the wolves, so that's yeah. quite nice. <laughs> Thank you, Z. So this is the portal that I was talking about. This is going to take me to the capital, Lane Dell. And it was really good, because right now I could go and kill Morgoth, who's the main boss of this legacy dungeon, but it would be followed by a dialogue, which takes about 16 seconds with Melina. And I can actually skip that. If I progress further into the game, all the way to the Forge, and I get to Far Missoula, uh, you'll see if you haven't played the game, I'll mention it later as well. Um, I'm going to be able to skip that dialogue if I kill Morgoth then. So I'm not going to kill Morgoth now, and I'm going to go ahead and sequence break past this entire area. I do that by backtracking. Instead of going inside Lindell, I'm actually leaving it right now. And I'm going to the outskirts area. While I was waiting for the elevator, you saw me pop two remembrances. That's of the Moose and of Godric. Uh, to in total, it gave me 50k runes. And that's going to allow me to get 31 intelligence here on this grace. I need to spend these runes because I'll be wrong warping just in a second. So I'm going to sit down. And pop everything into intelligence. Intelligence is what the beam scales with. And as that is the main attack of choice, that's where I want to, you know, get my damage from while the flame actually scales off of faith. That's why the Sword of Night and Flame has both, uh, you know, requirements for both faith and intelligence levels. I'm gonna hop off here, set up Pegasus. If I did it correctly, which I'm not sure I did, I might actually, yeah, okay, nice, I got Pegasus in one. So I stored Torrents, the Torrent storage, uh, with the first quit out, and at the same time, I was so close to the edge of the platform that he fell off in, uh, in one go, so that's quite nice. So right now, what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to kill Morgod, and then you're supposed to get the rolled medallion in order to activate the next uh, elevator, Grand Lift of, Lift of Rolled, which takes you upstairs there, or uphill, uh, to the mountaintops of giants. However, because I don't kill Morgod, I do not have the medallion, and I cannot activate the elevator. Well, fortunately, Miyazaki has my back, and I'll be able to get there anyway with a sequence break. But uh, first, you see me just running in a straight line. Normally, you're supposed to, like, kill Morgoth, which unseals a specific door. And you're supposed to run all the way through Lanedale there, take an elevator to get down here to the Forbidden Woods. But instead, I can just run in a straight line here. And as I'm doing that, Nico, you know what to do. You know the score. We have a $50 donation from JB that goes towards the Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins Glitchless bonus category of an any percent thank you very much for the 50 dollars and we've got a lovely one here 30 dollars from mum sparkle that says robo here this donation is from my mum who has always been supportive of esa since worms armageddon is one of my favorite games of all time i'd like to take the name of the worms as a tribute to her support of the last 10 years love you mum less than free and of course the name the $30 donation goes towards the name mum sparkle thank you very much for the donations and it's back to you yeah thank you keep them keep them going worms are awesome i agree it's been a long time since i played them but 
I have some fond memories of when I was a kid playing Worms. So I can't wait to watch that run later. So uh, there's another Gargoyle behind me because, yeah, Miyazaki, the creator of this game, has some fetish for Gargoyles and hands and feet. But that's besides the point. The point is that I don't want to fight it, so I'm not. But instead, again, what I do, just like for Smarag, I quit out in order to de-aggro it so that I can warp. I'm going to get on this elevator and I'm going to go ahead and perform the wrong warp. And it just so happens... It just so happens... Um, that the default position for this particular area is at the top of the elevator. So after I quit out here and load back in, I'm gonna spawn in the mountaintops of giants. Which is really, really good. So the gargoyle is one of the world bosses, and so was the dragon earlier. There's like 170 bosses or something yeah. in this game, so that's why he's not running all bosses category. That's right, yeah. There's 165 bosses to be exact. Uh, the current recce for that run is about five and a half hours, so it's not the longest, there's definitely longer runs. But the thing is that, like, you basically get no chill in those five and a half hours. Just like I get no chill from these wrong warps, because I'm going to walk off here, which is, which is going to activate the death cam, but that's fine. Because the death cam and the kill planes are usually separated. They're two planes that are usually stacked on top of each other, but not quite overlapping. Uh, okay, I messed up. That's completely fine. So this is what happens when you actually mess up the wrong warp and warp a little bit too soon. Because the first warp wasn't really fully activated yet. The second warp just happened normally instead of, uh, you know, being uh, corrupted. So that's why I always take a little bit of a short break and listen. Like that. I, you hear that bell sound? I wait for quite a while, and then right before the game warps me to the last race, that's when I confirm the new warp. And that way I can spawn in the default position of the newly selected grace through the map. So there's a little bit of precision, and, and that's the reason why I've been also like pausing my speech during that glitch, because you can mess it up for sure. And if you do it too late, then you're just going to spawn on the grace, because the first warp finishes and nothing else happens, obviously. So the reason I did this is to go to the, uh, to the consecrated snow field, right? This is what uh, north of Sweden looks like, is what I've been told. I haven't been there, but apparently that's, that's how it is. Um, the reason I want to go here, uh, not to north of Sweden, but to the snow field, is because there are somber smithing stones 8 and 9 here, so I'm going to be able to upgrade my weapon. And also I can go to Mog, and I don't really need like any power to fight Mog, you're going to see why. Damn, the, the, the beetle actually fell on my head and, and damaged me, so that's that's cute. Uh, there's an enemy here, I make sure to run around it. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually heal up for safety, because the plus 9 pickup is, is quite annoying. There's some lightning balls around it that can one-shot... Well, I guess two-shot me, really. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to make it not happen. Okay, we're fine. So... Yeah, now that I have plus 8 and plus 9, I'll be able to upgrade my weapon to... Well, almost its final form, but I'm not going to get plus 10, because that's actually a little bit slower and wouldn't really benefit me. I'm going to get this grace, because I'm going to have to come back later to go to uh, the Halic Tree, which is like one of the most late-game areas in the game. So we'll be doing that later when we have more stats and more power. And I'm going to go ahead and unequip my armor. You'll see in a bit why. And I'm going to wrong war from here again, which is going to take me closer to the Mogwin Palace entrance. <clears throat> And after that is going to be one of the few strats that I actually discovered. And of course, because it's a strat that I discovered, it's going to involve dying on purpose, because that's like the only thing that I can do, that I can do well anyways. So what I'm going to abuse here is the first out of few instances where I abuse the stakes of Marika. So I die on purpose. That's why I unequipped my armor. So that looked kind of painful, I'm not going to lie. And essentially in this game, instead of just being able to spawn at the last grace, there are also these... Stakes of Marika, they're called. And they're basically checkpoints that you can spawn at as well. You cannot rest at them, you cannot level at them. See, it's like right there on the ground. And I can abuse that by getting a little bit closer to the Mogwin Palace instead of uh, running over here. And what's more important is that I was gonna get invaded by an NPC, uh, which is like part of the game. And during the invasion, you cannot use the horse, but I was able to use the horse for a bit because I died there on purpose because the invasion didn't happen. But the second invasion happens, and it's important because the Sanguine Noble um, needs to be killed in order to enter the Mogwin Palace through the portal here. Now, as you saw earlier, killing NPCs is quite annoying. So actually, I'm going to use a very special method for it. I'm going to run around here. I'm going to get down on this ledge, just like this. 
I'm gonna look into the wall, look back, look back, block, and here he comes. Bye. <laughs> With authority, dude. No fear on that guy. I respect it. It's actually important to not aggro this Albinaric here because when they're both aggroed and standing on top of the ledge, sometimes the game has this AI script where if you have like two enemies aggroed, what it's going to do is it's going to tell one of the enemies to sort of kind of chill so that they're not attacking you at the same time. However, with the Albinaric there, it can happen to both of them and then memes occur because like neither of them are going to try to attack you and you're just going to be standing there, you're going to be standing there and it's, it's all kinds of awkward, so... It's like the reverse God can do. That's, yeah, pretty much right. <laughs> Which actually is true because the God can do... I think it got patched, but originally they didn't have that script in their AI and just kept on ganking you all the time. So Mogwin Palace is basically kind of self-isolated small legacy dungeon with Mog as the final uh, boss of it. It's a, it's a really, really good boss fight. I like it. Uh, and I hope you don't, because you're not going to see much of it. Um, fortunately, at the start of Mogwin Palace, I can use the horse. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and get on Pegasus in order to navigate around and then use this convenient cliff on the left side to gain height. Now, right there in the chest, there's plus 10 uh, Somber Smithing Stone upgrade, the Ancient Somber Smithing Stone. But getting it would force me off of the horse, and I would also have to bait away an NPC. So, uh, yeah, it's not actually faster than just getting Rogier set later on in, instead of it. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean. And, like, getting both Rogier and plus 10 would be overkill. I, I would have too much damage. I wouldn't really be saving anything. So I enter the fight, and the first thing I do is, because I'm scared, I'm just going to peace out. So I go ahead and hop to this part here. I gain height using the tombstones, and then I go ahead and quit out at this uh, stable ground right next to the fog wall. And much like with Godric, which I didn't explain earlier, because I do not enter the fight through the fog gate, um, the AI script for the boss doesn't activate. So uh, just like Godric, Mog is going to take it like a champ. So I'm just going to, you know... Run up to him. I can uh, do a little bit of teabagging and whatever. Then I'm going to apply RKR. I'm going to blast him in the face a couple of times. So killing Mog right now is really good because he is, he is very rich. And because he's very rich, he's going to give us 420,000 souls. I'm not making that up. It is actually 420. And that's going to allow me to like level up quite a bit. So there's Mog. I'm going to go ahead and go to the road of the manor first. This is to upgrade my weapon at Ichi. It's a little bit faster than going to the uh, round table hold and using the other blacksmith, Hugh. So I get on uh, the horse and we talk to him. Uh, I don't want to purchase these. I already did. Okay, get plus nine. And I'm going to go back to the main academy gate. And I'm not going to walk to the volcano manor. This time I'm actually going to go ahead and do the fight. But I'm going to do it in a very special way. Because one thing I haven't mentioned is that we are on patch 1.02. And the Sword of Night and Flame and the RKR glitch, uh, the Sword of Night and Flame is strong and the RKR glitch works uh, on this patch. So that's why I'm using it. But what also works on this patch is the Pizza Swap or the Chainsaw Glitch, whatever you want to call it. So I'm just reorganizing some inventory here in order to be able to show it off. I'm putting items into my chest in order to be uh, able to sort them later by order of acquisition and basically put the Serpent Hunter and the Sword of Night and Flame next to each other this way. And what I'm going to do is a glitch that is actually the fastest way to play the game. Uh, the current recce for it is 105. Uh, and the, the fastest Sword of Night and Flame run was like 116. However, I don't show the chainsaw glitch, the pizza swap routes in marathons for one simple reason. And that is because it's just not as good of a showcase of the category. Already you can kind of like polemize about how good of a showcase, you know, Sword of Night and Flame is. And I guess in the future, the, some of the best showcases when it comes to fights and what the fights can be with the Serpent Hunter and with staggering bosses and stuff like that is going to be glitchless. But right now, this is only the second time Elden Ring has been at a, at a bigger speedrunning marathon. So, uh, yeah, I decided to go with Sword of Night and Flame. But I want to show you the pizza swap anyway, and Renala is a pretty good target for it, because there's going to be a lot of enemies in there that I can hit with it, and you're going to see the destructive power. Hopefully, anyway. I got memed last time I tried, so hopefully that doesn't happen. So this time, instead of going for the water wheel, well, I'm still going for the water wheel, just for the left side. I'm going to pop a Remembrance, Mog's Remembrance, while I'm waiting to gain height. 
and I'm going to prepare my inventory. Order of acquisition. You see it's, uh, the Serpent Hunter, Sword of Night, and Flame are next to each other. That is going to be important. Because what I'm going to do, essentially, after getting enough height here, and then also doing like a little bit of a tricky jump to get even more height and get on the bridge and essentially skip to the uh, very end of the academy instead of ha having to run through it, is I'm going to abuse the fact that I can go ahead and activate the stunts of the Sword of Night and Flame, so holding L2. There we go. That's actually harder than it looks. And I'm going to transfer it over to the Serpent Hunter. And the game, because I'm using a, a, a stance on a weapon that doesn't have it, it's going to default to the first one on the list. So this enemy is hella annoying. So let's see if he gets on the lift with me. Nope. Bye-bye. Not for luck with trying, though. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not letting this shit happen again. So I need to go ahead and drop the, drop the shield. Otherwise, he'll get in the way. That's how I got meme last time. And I'm going to use the stance on the Serpent Hunter, and it's going to default to the first one on the list, which is actually the Giza's Wheel, which is the weapon that looks like a big pizza cutter, and that hits repeatedly. So let's go ahead and then let's try to perform it. Let's see if I can get it. So I'm supposed to kill the children here in order to uh, break the seal, sort of, and get Renala to drop down. That's happening right now. As you can see, I... Uh, yeah, I just have a lot of AoE and a lot of damage and a lot of destructive power. So that was phase one. Now phase two is going to start with a familiar attack, but not from me. So uh, yeah, she's going to try, but miss. And then I'm going to show her the power of the pizza cutter, and I'm just going to cut her to pieces. And that's it. That's Renala right there. <laughs> uh. So now we're going to head over to Radan. Before Radan, I'm going to go ahead and level up because I'm going to be abusing the stake again, the stake of Marika. Um, so I need to, because I'll be dying, I need to spend these runes. So I'm going to level up some Vigor. Vigor is going to uh, allow me to, you know, get more health and survive. And I'm going to get uh, 50 intelligence here. There we go, which boosts my damage. Also, speaking of pizza, my favorite is four types of cheese, which I believe Italians call quattro formaggi. Yeah, I hope the pronunciation was good. <laughs> I, I tried. Uh, yeah, you have a quattro formaggi next time on me. Okay, that sounds good. So I actually messed up as I was very excited about getting a free pizza. That's completely fine because I'll spawn right next to this. But, uh, or maybe I should have said that was the first intentional death in order to perform the skip. But uh, yeah, it, it wasn't. So essentially what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to go through the legacy dungeon here and you're supposed to activate a, a festival and then sort of like get through it and fight Radan on this like really big ass beach. But what I can do is I can just jump down here, avoid the kill boxes this time. The first time I didn't, I didn't jump far enough. And I'm going to spawn close enough to the stake of Marika that's in front of Radan's arena and just be able to gi be given the option in order to, uh, to spawn there. So this way I can skip the entire Legacy Dungeon and go directly to Radan. It's a really big skip and, and really cool because the Legacy Dungeon of his is kind of boring. So for Radan, there's a bunch of RNG. Hopefully we don't get trolled. The strategy is to approach him as fast as possible while baiting out some specific attacks. First, I'm going to run behind this item in order to block the first orb. Then I'm going to abuse the iframes that I get from hopping on the horse to uh, just, yeah, invincibility frame through it. This is looking good so far. He does the overhead. Hopefully, he does a shotgun attack now. Uh, very good. Now, I'm going to hope for another shotgun. There we go. And now, I'm going to start approaching him. I did it a little bit too soon, so he actually opened up with a melee attack. Which is fine, however. I'm going to stay close, so he misses with everything. I applied RKR. I'm going to do a hit. He's going to go ahead and start buffing. I get behind him. I apply RKR. And, and he's dead. So that was Radan. Messed up a little bit, but no big deal. And now everyone that's a big fan of like pot boys and jars and stuff, I, I advise you to look away because yet again, for the sake of speed, I have to commit horrendous acts of violence. And I obviously hate doing it, as you can tell. I'm going to apply RKR, spawn next to Alex, and unfortunately it has to be done. But pot friend. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I do the small turnaround trick here again to be able to warp immediately. You're supposed to rest at this grace, um, but uh, I can actually go ahead and, and, and warp a little bit sooner if I do it during the turnaround animation. And now I'm going to head to the forge because like the only other thing that's kind of left here would be Morgoth, but I want to do that after the forge. 
So we're going to head to the Forge. The reason I killed Alex, by the way, is because he has the Warrior Jar Shard. And the Warrior Jar Shard gives you 10% bonus damage to your weapon skills. So that's going to boost the attacks of my Sword of Night and Flame. As if you didn't have enough boosts already with RKR. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's never enough, I guess. I mean, there's never enough damage. Fortunately, I don't one-shot everything, so... I mean, I would say, like, Pizza Cutter is damage enough. <laughs> I would do it a little less, gladly. <laughs> That's fair enough, I guess. Yeah, the, the the game's in a little bit of a weird spot when it comes to, like, the, the leaderboard categories and the fastest routes. So, I set up Pegasus here. That's because Mountaintops of Giants is actually, like, really, really big. But what it abuses is the fact that it's a vertical area. So, it sends you from point A to point B and then back to point A but being higher. However, what I can do is I can abuse this rock in order to gain the height and perform a pretty difficult glitch here, pretty difficult skip, because there's death planes everywhere. Like, if I gain just a little bit of a extra height, I'm going to die. So I need to make sure that I, that I don't drop or I do not get too high up. I'm going to abuse this little weird-looking tree. I'm going to line myself up. Do a double jump, land on the branch. Okay, first part done. Now I need to get on this branch to get a little bit of extra height. Very nice. And then this part. Uh... Yeah, I think I have max height. So that's first part done. Then I have to run out wide to not activate the death cam, which I did, which is fine. It's no big deal. Uh, I'm going to lose a little bit of time to it. I need to make sure to get on the flat ground here first. There we go. And now I can quit out. So this is exactly what I was talking about earlier, that the death cam and the kill planes, they're separated from each other. So the first part of the skip I did correctly. I managed to... Uh, navigate all around the kill planes and I didn't die but then there's a death cam right under the cliff and you saw what happens if you only hit the death cam you get this like top down or bottom up view and essentially activate tank controls and the problem with that is that like nothing is going to load or deload in that state so I couldn't even like if I somehow could navigate in that state I wouldn't have been able to go ahead and uh, uh, get to the next area because it simply wouldn't load so what I planned on doing was essentially uh, scaling up a rock and, and, and uh, shorting in the, the path that I would have to take through this upper area. But now without the no gravity, I just have to run around a little bit more. And this is basically where I would s sort of end up. So as you can see, we didn't lose that much time. And then obviously you saw me quit out in order to get rid of the death cam. So I'm going to run through here. I'm going to go to the left side. There's two ways to navigate around here. I go left in order to get the grace. I get the grace just in case the fire giant memes me. He's, uh, he should be fine. There's some pretty specific timing and positioning, of course, that I'll be doing in order to kind of break his bracelet on his leg, which exposes his weak spot, but then still with the same attack, be hitting that weak spot. And if that kind of goes air eye, also this bird is kind of annoying in my face. Scary. Yeah, it's, it's all good. It seems like it anyways. But yeah, if I, if I like miss and I do not get the extra damage, I might get memed by Fire Giant a little bit, so always better to get that grace there in the marathon. So what I'll start the fight with is I'm going to start by actually staying, uh, keeping my distance and trying to bait out an AoE attack. I'm going to dodge that by hopping off the horse and abusing the iframes of that if he decides to do it. When she doesn't, he goes directly for the attack that I want actually, so that's quite nice. I'm going to wait for him to start pulling forwards, blast him, get the extra damage, go back into the right. Another beam, enough to get through the first phase, that's very good. Second phase starts with him being kind of angry, so I wait for him to get angry and slam his hand. And then I hit the hand, which is a weak spot as well, and he's dead. Very nice. That was smooth. I yeah, like absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely. Well done. I like, all these bosses have... Uh, uh like this super precise pattern that you, you can get. Uh, and either like you, you get them, you are good and you get good attacks, or like you lose wide amounts of time, half a minute, one minute, like like it's nothing. So well done there. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a great point, actually, that like some of these boss fights, like you might look at them and be like, well, what's he doing that impressive? Well, <laughs> not much, but uh, a lot of it is not just like getting in the boss's face and then uh, beaming them twice, you know, even though it looks like it is. There's some positioning that I'm doing in order to kind of try to bait out the specific attacks. And then, uh, like I said, with Fire Giant specifically, I need to be hitting the weak spots. So that's like another thing that I need to do. 
And if you don't get the pattern that you're looking for, like the difference, as John pointed out, between like the perfect fight and, and the fight that you might end up with is, uh, yeah, it's, it's not... Uh, there, there's a big disparity there. So here's the forge. I'm going to talk to Melina. She's going to sacrifice herself, whatever. Um, transport me to Farmazula, basically a late game area. But I'm not going to go ahead and fight the bosses there yet because I need to be doing a skip, the one that I pick up the Devour Scepter for. However, I'm still missing one key piece of that puzzle. So I'm going to get transported to Azula. I'm in a trap state again, so that means I need to reach a Grace. So I'll be running towards a Grace, and I cannot activate the horse here because even though I would have Pegasus activated, I cannot hop on the horse in this area. And as I'm going to be doing that, running through this area, I think it's perfect time for some donations. Sounds good to me. We've got a $50 donation from Batista2512. I don't get the context of this donation, but maybe you might as well. DS2AA. <laughs> don't, don't read that next time. <laughs> <laughs> We've also got a $25 donation from Lambda that says, Good cause ahead. All the more time for fat co coin purse. I was like, is that... Coin purse or is it coin purse? But that goes towards the $25 donation for the Frenzied Flame ending choice, which means Frenzied Flame is at $321. Rani's ending is at $305. It's getting tight. We're getting very near to a point where we may be having to finally choosing that ending. So if you want to get your last minute donations in, how many minutes do we roughly have, Kata? I have no idea. I mean, still got time. Still got like 30 minutes or so, 20, 30 minutes. Perfect. Let's see how much more donations we can get towards those bid incentives. Let's go. Back to you. Yeah, I'm going to need the Rani stands to kind of pick up their game. Come on, guys. We all want to see the marriage ending. So as I'm running through here, one more thing that I did that you might have noticed or not, I don't know, is that when I was jumping, I made sure to do a jump attack. That is because in this game, when you land, even like from very small landings, not, not this small, for example, but if I landed on this lower platform, the game would deplete a lot of my stamina. Like this jump, for example, it would deplete so much stamina. So what I do instead is I attack midair, then the game depletes stamina for the jump attack, but upon landing, it doesn't deplete any more stamina for the landing. So I get to keep more stamina this way, which means more sprint up time. Same thing here, for example. So here is the grace that I'm going to be getting to. I'm going to make sure to rest because it's kind of glitchy. There's sort of the dragon behind us. And he's like part of the environment. It's kind of weird. So he might stay activated. And then it's not going to allow me to warp. So I make sure to keep my distance. Like the dragon's up there. And this way I'm able to go ahead and warp. And I'm going to go to the round table hold again. And this time it's actually for the Rogier uh, spell armor. This is an NPC that's here. He's part of a quest line. And getting through the forge actually kills him. So rip him. Press F to pay respect. Now, because progressing quest lines is always done in a very fascinating manner, I, uh, I talk to him and then I'm going to quit out three times in order to progress his quest line f far enough to where he actually dies and I can pick up his set. His set is really good because each piece that I equip, there's four pieces, gives 2% extra damage to uh, sorceries. So it's going to boost our beam from the Sword of Night and Flame. So there you go, I got the set. And now finally, I'm gonna go back to the Capital Rampart and go fight more gods. Except not really. Just like you were not, just like I was hoping you're not a fan of Mog. I hope you guys are also not fans of more gods because uh, yeah, we, we, the fight is not gonna be very exciting. Well, I mean, it might be exciting. It's just not really gonna be a fight. So I set up Pegasus here again in the same place, but this time instead of going to the elevator, I'm going to head directly towards Lanedale, or I should say like around its outer wall. And I'm going to set up uh, some very, very, very specific glitch. But first you saw this time I didn't get it in one. I didn't get Pegasus in one, so I had to walk off the platform. Again, if you're just joining us, you're wondering why I'm like flying around on the horse is because I can quit out when jumping off the horse, then quit out next to the end of a platform, throw him through a kill box like that, which disables his gravity, but then I can resummon him and just ride him when he has no gravity enabled. So this way, I'm able to uh, keep the horse in areas where I'm not supposed to keep him, and of course also shorten the running distances a lot. So what I do here is I'm going to run into this wall, jump into it. That's going to uh, load Lanedale proper. Say that three times fast in a row. 
And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically stand on a platform, which is going to store my position on it, because it's flat ground. And I'm going to stand in such a way that I'm going to be as close to the Landell wall as possible. So upon loading back in, I'm going to load Landell immediately. But then I'm going to jump to the side after the loading screen and start falling into the void, if done correctly, while I loaded Landell. If I don't jump to the side immediately, I'm just going to land on like this lower platform there. And the game's going to force me off the horse because after loading screen, remember, Pegasus is not activated anymore. So I walk off in a very specific way, which, again, stores my position as close to the wall, close to the pillar there as possible. I noticed I do a lot of like stuff with my hand, which is kind of awkward. And I'm going to jump for forwards first and then immediately pivot left like this. So Landell is loaded, as you can see, the wall was there, but I'm falling down through the seven seas, through rocks, through everything. Now, normally, there's, like I said, there's a 12-second kill timer that's supposed to kill you if you're infinitely falling. And I'm also not getting killed by anything because I jumped off in such a place where there's no kill boxes, right? Like, th that's an area you're not supposed to really reach, so no kill boxes extend to this particular place. But if I'm on a horse while I'm falling, I can attack repeatedly. Normally, you can only attack once in the air. On the horse, I can attack repeatedly. Every repeated attack resets this 12-second timer. So what ends up happening is I fall so far under the map that I deload the map. And guess who actually cannot attack while midair? Well, Morgoth. So after 12 seconds, when the map is deloaded, you're only going to get to hear a sound. But you're going to have to trust me that he's going to go down. I can also do uh, cool 360s, I guess, on the horse. That's a... Uh uh, that's a nice thing. It like adds to the fact that this fight is already like one of the most riveting in the entire run. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm, I'm, can contain the excitement, honestly. And boom, that's Margot. Yeah, very nice, dude. That was almost as tough as the mimic fight. I, I yeah. really had to try. So you can see that like my runes in the bottom left, uh, bottom right. Sorry, they uh, they got to a higher number. I also have the remembrance, so the boss is dead. And the reason I warped away immediately is because if you have played the game casually, you'll know that after killing Morgoth, you're basically trapped in the Elden Throne, and you need to go ahead and touch the thorns, and only then you can rest at a grace. You get given the roll medallion, and then you can leave. But uh, that happens like no matter where you kill him. Even if I killed him like that, it would have happened. However, if I warp immediately when the boss dies, I do not get trapped. I would get trapped if I return to Lanedale right now, but there's nothing to do there anymore, so I don't have to do that. Instead, I'm getting hugged here by Fia, uh, which is not super pleasant because she gives me a debuff, essentially, which loses 5% of my uh, HP, which is not the biggest thing. But the reason I'm doing this is because of 40 sacks. It's the boss that I mentioned right at the start of the run when I was getting the Curse Mark of Death. Um, this is for this quest. You talk to her, she tells you, oh, you need to find Curse Mark. I'm like, psych, I got it already. <laughs> and I'm going to be able to go ahead and enter the boss fight. Should also equip my talismans. I'll be popping some, some remembrances when I'm done with the fight. I, I choose to die or ruin an and then again, to progress the quest line, I just quit out to refresh the entire area. It's, uh, yeah, we spend about, I want to say, like five, six minutes. Uh, trying to gain access to this Remembrance boss fight. And if everything goes well, it's it's not going to last much longer than 5-6 seconds. So I equip Rogier here to get the extra damage boost. I'm going to run directly towards 40 sacks. I'm going to apply RKR in a pretty specific place. Hopefully. And I'm going to aim for his head with the beam. And deal a lot of damage. And they'll deal a lot of damage, and that's 40 sacks, so... Spend a lot of time gaining access to him, and, and now he's gone. I counted roughly like 15 seconds of a fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, while I'm waiting for the game to just warp me out of the area, I pop the Remembrances, because I'll be leveling up right now, because I need to rest. Anyway, so I'll be using that rest to level up. It's going to be the second to last level up of the run. I'm going to go to the Temple Quarter Grace, which we took way earlier in the run as well, when I go to the main academy, um, Raya Lucaria Academy, the main gate of it. So here I'm going to go ahead and level up uh, 34 Vigor and 52 Intelligence. Uh, the Vigor is basically for comfort. Uh, there's some stuff where I might get hit by enemies. This will allow me to survive that. And... Hello, Octopus. 
And the 52 intelligence is actually important for Millennia later on, which is going to be a boss coming up uh, in a short while. And it essentially gives me enough damage from four beams to be able to finish the first phase in, in, for, uh, in four beams. So that is a very important level up. From here, I'm going to run towards Astel. Now, if you play the game casually, you might be wondering, why am I running down here to Lyurnia when I'm going to Astel? Well, Astel is like down under the ground, but after Astel, there's actually a very big elevator that takes you to the top of that area right there. That means that Astel himself is underneath where we are right now, and there's a way to actually get there quicker out of bounds. I'm going to take this Grace. The reason I take this one is in case Rani wins the ending. So I'll be having to... Uh, I'll be needing to come back here later, hopefully, if you guys donate enough towards Rani's ending. And Do you mind if I jump in about Rani's oh, ending me, as well? Give me just a second, okay? No problem. I'll go ahead and set up Pegasus here in order to get out of bounds. And I'm going to run towards an area where the elevator is. And I'll be able to touch a rock and road the elevator shaft. And then if I touch the elevator... That all sounded like kind of weird, but uh, not in a little sense. When I touch the elevator, I'm going to be having my position stored there in Lake of Rot. And if I wrong warp, I'm going to spawn directly in front of Astel. So I set up Pegasus, hopefully correctly. Sometimes you can die. Fortunately, it hasn't happened yet during the Pegasus setups. And Nico, take it away. No problem. We've actually got an anonymous $100 donation going towards Rani's ending, Woo. which means we're currently at... $444.69, whilst Frenzy Flame is at $321. That is a great leap. But for those who want to see Frenzy Flame, uh, Frenzy Flame, can we bring it back up? That's the next question. But we've also got a few more donations from another anonymous donator of $25. No comment. Thank you very much for the donation. And Stennis uh, donates $10. Here we go. Are you ready for this, Kata? Not DS2A again, dude. Come on. Kata devours the bosses almost as fast as he devours the hotel buffet. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see him devour the achievements in DS2. It seems to be a recurring <laughs> thing, doesn't it? Thank I you so much for the donations. It. I knew it. I knew there was a hook there. They had me in the first half, not gonna lie. <laughs> so I touched the rock there. I loaded this elevator. Now I actually have to pay attention. Because failing this wrong war, which I hope I didn't, would take me all the way back uh, to the Stormhill Grace. I would have to run back here. Yeah, so we got it. That's nice. So saved a bunch of time over failing there. And I'm going to head towards Astel. Now, Astel is this boss that is really, really annoying in this route. Because essentially, if you deal too much damage to him too early, he's going to teleport away. But um, if you attack him way too late, he's going to start hitting you and stuff. And, and that's usually not good, so... You have to sort of time your attacks correctly, even if you get the good RNG. And perfect RNG, essentially, just beam him in the face, he dies. Bad RNG, he teleports away, starts sending, like, meteorites everywhere, and gets really weird. So he opened up with a beam, that's good. I'm gonna do the little crouch cancel again to get stamina back. That's a good follow-up, I don't even have to roll it, because I'm close enough. I'm gonna apply RKR, and this is where I'm gonna delay my attack slightly, to not hit him too early. Okay, it's a decent follow-up, but he's probably gonna port now. Yeah, there he is. So he teleports away. And he's gonna go for the Meteors. Now, this is one of the lovely attacks that no one really has any idea how to dodge consistently. So I'm just gonna pray, wait for it to come in. Roll sort of in a half circle, reapply RKR. Let's see what it does. Melee attack, blast his face, and he's done. Okay, cool. So that was, you know, besides the teleport, that was actually very smooth, so I'm happy about that. So now it's finally time to go to the Halleck Tree, uh, which I'm going to do from the Inner Consecrated Snowfield Grace, which I took earlier. And there's a couple of cool things here. So first of all, I'm going to be doing two skips, because the only way to get into this uh, next area is to complete this Everjail, which are like sort of isolated realms, like... I don't want to say mini-games, because they're not, but you basically get sent to a different kind of world, and you're supposed to finish something there. Sometimes there's a boss, sometimes you're supposed to light some fires or undo some seals. And this one is particularly annoying in the liturgical town of Ordina, because there's invisible enemies grabbing you out of nowhere like they ran the Orden, and also there's, like, insane arches that are sniping you from everywhere. So in order to skip past all of that, I'm going to go ahead and channel my inner Skyrim and start uh, climbing some rocks. 
without Pegasus. And uh, I spoke earlier about how Miyazaki tried to counteract speedrunners. This is actually one of the things. He deleted this rock, like literally this rock I'm going to walk on. He just straight up deleted this thing in the 1.04 patch. So you cannot do this skip the same way anymore. But we found a different way, fortunately. So I hop on like that. That was very good. And I'm going to activate this portal and get into the Halic Tree. The Halic Tree is where the Vigor can actually help. Because there's an, these enemies here, this is the highest scaling area in the game. It has an internal scaling of 19. While something like Kaelid, I believe, has like 11. So there's a really, really big difference. And all the enemies hit like a truck. So there's going to be a bunch of quitouts that I'll be doing, essentially, in order to reset them, especially for the ants. There's two different pathways down here. I used to take the first one. For some reason, I started dying to it recently, like randomly, so I don't do it anymore. In regular runs, it doesn't really matter because what we use is the in-game time to time the runs. So that means these loading screens that you see here, they're not part of the run because they vary uh, between different you know, different machines. Like, different runners with different computers can have differently long loading screens. So in order to ensure fair competition, we cut out those loading screens. So doing quitouts, like, okay, that's not nice. So I just go grab there. Speaking of quitouts, that one saved me there because uh, the grab uh, deals damage later in the animation, so I can just reset it and then continue onwards. Actually, dealt damage. So you see Vigor coming in hot. So I can go ahead and heal up. And I'm going to do another quit out. Like I said, in regular runs, it doesn't really matter. At a marathon in RTA, I got hit again, whatever. Um, good thing I healed. In marathons, you obviously lose a little bit of time, but it's honestly worth it because these, uh, these bubbles and these enemies, they just, they just hit hard. So for this set of bubbles, I'm not going to quit out. And Okay, I managed to avoid it, so that's good. I'm going to heal up to full just in case I take damage from this fall. It can happen. And then I'm going to rest at this grace. Uh, to, in order to replenish my resources, I'm going to perform a skip here. Kind of cool, but it depends on enemy AI, so it can be very annoying, obviously. Especially in games like these, where Miyazaki has a special talent of making the AI as annoying as possible. I'm going to apply the blessing. This is more like a, I don't know, quality of life thingy, because it increases my poise, so it can kind of protect me in some scenarios. And I'm, I'm trying to bait out a specific attack here, so he cannot do it later. That's the one, because I cannot do the skip with that attack. So he approaches me, I'm gonna do a Gout Counter. He's too far from the edge, so I have to wait for him to attack again. Let's see what he does. Gout Counter, go to the left. No repost, that was too far. Gout Counter, go to the left, repost, and we <laughs> And we are alive. <laughs> so what I did there, as you could see, is... Um, a Gout Counter is a special feature of this game. It's a new feature where you basically attack immediately after blocking. And you deal quite a bit of poise damage, which means you can stagger the enemy. And if the enemy is staggered, you can repost them. And upon the repost, you enter an animation that has invincibility frames. And because I activated the repost just as I was falling down, I managed to have the invincibility frames activated during the time when the game was supposed to deal fall damage to me. So this is Loretta. Uh, the fight is not going according to plan, but it'll be fine, hopefully. I'll kind of dodge whatever she's doing. Okay, yeah, nice try. She's dead. Ow, ow. <laughs> Even from the dead trying to get me, like freaking martyrdom from Call of Duty 4. And <laughs> the corpse drops the grenades. Yeah, that, that was a source of a lot of pain, just like this game. Um, yeah, so for Loretta, I essentially, again, there was some timing and positioning on the beams. Also, what a thrill. Uh, nice ladder, Visions of Snake. And essentially, I ran to the side and activated my first beam as she was jumping up. Then she did a follow-up, I strafed it, I did another beam, then because I dealt enough damage, she went to buff, and I did another beam, and then I dodged some last attack. She was supposed to be normally dead after the third beam, but because some things were a little bit scuffed, I didn't get the full damage. Like, I was a little bit off axis, so the entire beam didn't hit. And uh, that way I needed to do one more uh, finishing touch afterwards. So here is this Scarlet Rot Knight. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, dodge it, hopefully. That's a grab attack, so I just roll to the left. I'm going to activate this grace because another death is coming up. But, uh, yeah, intended, actually. And that is because there's a pretty neat skip. I think if you guys haven't seen it, you're going to appreciate this one because it's so simple to do. Kata, you're not supposed to die to millennia, actually. That's not intended. <laughs> oh, well, that's uh, you're getting kind of ahead of ourselves. We're getting ahead of ourselves here. That's It's coming up after this death, dude. 
But yeah, I fall down this elevator shortcut, which is at the bottom, but my corpse is so heavy because I devoured the buffet together, and uh, that's why this button actually activates. And with it, that's the elevator as well. So now I'm going to spawn at the grace, and I can simply run back. It seems kind of slow, but it's much faster than going around because there's like a, an entire swamp area and everything. Because, of course, there's a lot of swamps in these games. Miyazaki just can't help making poison swamps. <laughs> yep. Imagine that you wake up one day and you're making the sixth swamp and ask, you ask yourself how you got there. I think a lot of sake is kind of the answer, but that's just a guess. So yeah, I can take this elevator now and basically kind of like sort of backtrack to Millennia instead of going the first intended path. Speaking of Millennia, this was the nightmare and still is the nightmare of a lot of players. With the Sword of Night and Flame, it's probably one of the most involved fights in the game. Uh, in the run when it comes to execution. So what I'm gonna do after entering the fight, I'm gonna apply RKR and I'm gonna roll in a very specific way and use the first beam again from a very specific distance and hopefully get full damage in which will uh, stagger her or like throw her on the ground. So that could be a good start to the fight. Let's see if that happens. Okay, so I got hit, so that's good. that's not good. That messes up with the setup completely and I'm dead. That's I, okay. What did I just tell you? I, You jinxed it, my dude. <laughs> Next time, just shh. <laughs> now that's fine. Um, so what happened there is my roll was mispositioned. Like I said, it's quite precise, so I got interrupted. And then I sort of just wanted to get back to full HP, and she decided to follow up with a jump attack and hit me before I healed. So that was, uh, that was not great. So unfortunately, you're not going to see the very cool first phase. Because if you do it correctly, like you kill her in the four beams, like I said, and it looks very stylish. So I'm sorry that I robbed you of that, but at least you have a reason to go to my YouTube because I have it there. <laughs> so instead what we're gonna do is like the first phase AI is kind of weird and she likes to idle a lot like this. So I'm gonna use that time to apply RKR and use the flame because the beam she would be able to dodge it. So here's the infamous waterfowl attack. I'm gonna go in and dodge it masterfully because she has no chance. After she killed me already, obviously she has no chance. So again, I'm gonna abuse the idle AI and I'm gonna go ahead and, and use the flame. I'm gonna get hit here. Which is fine. I have to wait for her to kind of chill, heal up. I also have to replenish FP because I cannot cast without any. Apply RKR. 80% damage boofed. Bo boost. Boost and buff. Which is boofed. <laughs> Technical term. I can go <laughs> And yeah, if I use the beam, she would just like run to the side and dodge it. But because the flame is so wide, you can see that she runs to the side but still gets hit. Okay, starting phase two, I'm gonna drink FP immediately to replenish it to full. I'm gonna dodge the Scarlet Aeonia AoE. On the explosion, I apply RKR once, twice, cancel the second one. This is for timing purposes, so that my second beam hits immediately when her attack is done, but not before another attack uh, starts. This way, I can actually stagger her, throw her on the ground. Third beam afterwards. Now dodge her stupid, silly stuff, and hopefully she does another AoE. Perfect. Dodge that one, run away, explosion, apply RKR, beam, numero uno, numero due, and that's Malenia, and she's down. Beautiful execution in this phase two. Nice. So now, there's basically nothing else left besides Farmozula, where we have the grace in front of the Godskin duo. But after killing Malenia, I also finally have the last piece of the puzzle for the skip. And that is Malenia's hand, or Hand of Malenia, which is her boss weapon, her katana. That weapon will allow me to break the game quite a bit. So I'm going to go ahead and get it. I'm going to walk away from Enya. And we're going to go back to Fire Missoula. And here, what I'm going to abuse is essentially another uh, kind of stun swap. Sort of like with pizza swapping, but it's a little bit different. It's gonna queue, I'm going to queue up stuns again with the... Sword of Night and Flame, but then, as it is queued up, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna, hold on, let me uh, fix my menu here really quickly. I hope no one likes uh, Godskin Duo because... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anyone does, yeah. honestly, besides like maybe the soundtrack, which is kind of dope, but... Um, yeah, so I'm gonna queue up a stance, and then as that is happening, I'm gonna swap out the Sword of Night and Flame for the Devour Scepter. And because the Devourer's Scepter, when you use its Ash of War, that's L2, um, at the start of it, it allows you to walk for a bit. And that way, I'm going to be able to get a little bit of an air walk. And with that air walk, I'm going to be able to follow up that with the Hand of Malenia. 
like this. So that's the air walk. And then because the waterfowl is still active, I can just do the second and third part and skip all the way on this bridge. So that was nicely done. And not only did we skip God's Can Duo, but we skipped the awful bridge section with a lot of the burbs and stuff. So burbs are nice, but not in this game. Miyazaki and his top 10 challenge again was like, let me make enemies that are more annoying than dogs. <laughs> uh, he succeeded, that's for sure. So, again, uh, the waterfowl dance is really stupid when it comes to giving you options to just traverse. So I'm going to do another little skip here. Instead of calling the elevator and waiting for it, I'm just going to get out of bounds using the waterfowl dance right this. Then I'm going to do this weird jump. That's because there's a kill box directly above me. So I actually need to make sure I don't hit it. So that was nice. And now we're going to head over to Plastidoo Sacks. And as I'm doing that, uh, we have time for one quick donation. Absolutely. We've got a uh, $50 donation from Bar uh, Bari Barikla, sorry. And it goes towards Argix Curse Sonic Costume. Thank you very much for the $50. Go for one more. Absolutely. Please tell me to stop when you're happy with uh, these kind of comments. Jeff the Big Lizard does $10 <laughs> and says, I think the beer ending is pretty cool. Almost as cool as the S2AA. And they donated towards Fear's ending, so that actually rains as ten dollars <laughs> yes yeah, people want to see if he has ending eh? <laughs> all right so with plastido sacks the strat is to deal enough damage in phase one to uh trigger him to basically start tr transitioning but not too soon so i need to make sure that i deal enough damage but not too much because that way i'm gonna be go ahead I'm, I'm gonna be able to go ahead and stagger him in four beams so i'm gonna approach him the first beam is gonna be without rkr to not over damage him apply rkr under his armpit, basically, while dodging the first storm. Dodge the second storm. Another beam. Dodge the third storm. And I got a good attack. This is random. Fortunately, the RNG was on my side this time. Stagger, replenish my FP, reapply RKR. One beam, second beam, and that's Placidus X. So, that looked very easy. But trust me, there's like so many memes that this dude can do when it comes to that last part. Like that, when, in that moment where I need the last beam, that is when he's gonna like start jumping away or hitting me with his claws. And yeah, there's a lot of RNG involved, but like I said, fortunately it was on our side for once. So yeah, go on. The worst part about it is that uh, he can teleport around the arena and waste so much time if he does anything but well, like die. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much, because he has like multiple phases and you're essentially forced to kind of go through them because he runs away at the end of each, each phase once you get past the HP threshold. Anyways, this is Malekith. Uh, Malekith also has some RNG. We'll see if he runs towards us or not. That's going to determine the first phase a lot. He's running towards me. That's good. I out strafe that, then go back in range to bait out these follow-ups and bait out this overhead. And whoop, that's phase one. Pretty good damage. And then phase two, I make sure to dodge this attack, position myself slightly to the right, delay the beam, and that's phase two. <laughs> uh, pretty good weapon, I, I heard. Sort of not in flame. Yeah, it's a pattern with all of these bosses, basically, like where the you know the optimal path is uh, like looks extremely simple, but it actually requires a lot of practice, a lot of uh, like very precise execution, uh, like even with as much damage as as we have. Uh, and th that's true for all the bosses that you've seen so far. Like, everything looks so simple, but it's actually very, very hard. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, because if I said that, people wouldn't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so here, um, we're still part of the last boss rush, so you guys have about, I don't know, maybe three minutes for the ending, uh, bit war. But before we call that off, um, I'm going to run through the Ashen Capital now, which is basically Lanedale, except... What I did by killing Malekith, I I don't know the lore of this game, okay? I don't play these games for lore. But uh, you, you basically release something called the Destined Death, which sort of like burns this earth tree. And uh, that's why there's all this ash, because we burn the thorns and stuff like that. And we want to get towards the earth tree. That's where the final boss is. But we're not going to go fight the final boss just yet. However, we are on the way there. And in our way is Gideon, the all-knowing. And because he knows so much, he also talks a lot of smack. So killing him would be very, very fast. But after you kill him, he literally talks for like 30 seconds or something like that. He's like right there waiting for me. Right there. He's chilling, right? And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run around here and go ahead and perform a 
trick called Gideon Skip. I'm going to use mouse and keyboard for that because it's a little bit more convenient to do it with mouse movements. One little thing I haven't mentioned is that like jumping uphill is actually slightly faster than just running. So you might have noticed me doing that a little bit throughout the run. In this corner, I'm going to jump on this branch. Jump on this branch. And I'm going to use the Loretta Sickle Weapon Arts to get on top of this branch uh, completely. And now we are out of bounds, even though it kind of doesn't look like it. But we are on the rooftop of where Gideon is. And we are able to completely outsmart him and just get past him and don't have to fight him at all. So that is very neat. Switch back to control in mid-air. Nice lag. It's pretty much guaranteed lag if you open the menu there for whatever reason. And I'm going to re-equip my stuff. And one more level up is going to be coming up here. I'm going to get 18 mines. This is so that I can do two beams and then summon the wolves. Still have enough FP to summon wolves. That's going to be for a glitch later on, on the last boss fight. And then the rest is just going to go into intelligence because I feel really smart after outsmarting Gideon. So 72 intelligence. And now for Godfrey, uh, essentially, when you enter the fight for the first time, there's a cutscene. And after the cutscene, you spawn in the middle of the arena. And that's not really good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter the fight and quit out immediately and re-enter it. That way I can go ahead and open with a beam while forcing his ranged attack. And then I'm going to roll backwards, hopefully, do another beam, and then finish him off with a third beam. And that will be phase one. And after that, I'm going to get the grace. And as I'm getting the grace, that's when the ending um, bit war is going to end, essentially. So a little heads up there. I'm going to re-enter the fight now. And I'm going to apply RKR at a pretty specific distance. Wait a little bit. Cast from a specific distance. He starts with the axe throw. Roll back, as I told you. Another beam. Does a lot of damage. He's going to charge away. Do his AoE attack. Reapply RKR. Finish him off. Now, I still have RKR activated. So I'm going to run backwards. And deal a lot of damage to this dude. One more. There we go. Okay, so that's oh, Horolu. <laughs> yeah. Just chipped away at him. So I'm going to get this grace, and this is the time to call the ending. So the ending is going to be Rani's ending at $444.69. Thank you very much to everyone who donated for that bid choice. I really appreciate that. Everyone that donated towards the ending incentive, thank you so much. Because it's, it's kind of just something I came up with on the spot during my last marathon appearance. And... Uh, people have had a lot of fun kind of donating towards the different endings, so I'm very happy that indeed that was the case here as well. And don't forget that even if you donated towards an ending we're not going to see, you know, you guys donated towards a great cause towards Save Your Children, a, a charity that's close to my heart, obviously. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for participating in that regard. I really, really appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and set up Pegasus here. I'm going to unequip the big hat because I cannot see shizzle and <laughs> very <laughs> smooth <laughs> I, I just dude my throat dude been talking too much what can i say uh, so yeah i activate pegasus here and this is because like i told you before there's the elevator that you're supposed to take after astel and that leads you to the place where you can actually get rani's ending so that's why i took the converted tower grace i'm gonna go ahead and instead of running inside of the inside of the cliffs like we did last time i'm gonna run around and as you can see, there's floor that I can, or like ground that I can get on. I need to make sure to kind of distance myself from the edge here. That's because you can just fall off these platforms up here. So that means there's kill planes down there everywhere. So I need to make sure that I get to a point where there's no kill planes to kill me. So I'm kind of above now. I feel like I should be good. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and approach the Moonlight Altar right now. Um... And that's another reason like why Curse Mark at the start of the run was available. It was just laying there in the Divine Tower. It's the same with this quest line. You don't have to do the previous steps at all, because Rani's quest lines, Rani's ending, takes quite a while to actually complete and finish. So instead, uh, I can just go ahead and run to the very final destination and essentially pick up the necessary item for the ending. So that is very neat. As I'm doing that, there's going to be a bit of running, so uh, we have time for some donations. Absolutely right. We have a $5 donation from Mikado that just says, 
Less than free. Less than free. Right back to you, buddy. And we've also got another five dollar donation, probably from your community as well, from Alibaba's FC98. That says, "Nice run, Kata. I'm almost as hyped as if I would saw if I if I would be if I would saw you streaming DS2AA. Surely it'd be any time now, right?" Well, not now. I'm kind of in the middle of the run. And unfortunately, <laughs> I have to catch my flight immediately after the run. Because, yeah, I'm not going to let you guys, just, like, tie me up to a chair and force me to do the S2AA here. There's no way that's happening. So... But you promised. I, there's no proof. Okay, maybe there is proof, but don't tell anyone, okay? Come on. <laughs> yeah, so... Sure, the S2AA soon. TM. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, yeah, there was a dragon spawning again. I don't really care. Um, I just run around him just like the first dragon. And we're going to watch these cutscenes because these are part of the ending. So we have quite a bit of time for the estimate. Uh, we're going to finish under estimates. Well, <laughs> hopefully, anyway, there's, uh, there's uh, kind of one and a half boss fights left, basically. So we're going to watch these cutscenes because uh, this is what you guys donated to Warriors. So this is Rani's doll, essentially. Um, it's not her real body. And now we're going to marry her. It's kind of quick. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Literally met her for the first time. I also think he's putting it on the wrong hand. I think he was supposed to put it on the left one. But who am I to say anyway? He's the Giga Chad, not me. Yeah. And he has a big hat, so. Very cool. So essentially, like, this... Uh, you see the two big fingers here. Uh... Basically, all like offsprings of the gods initially had some of these fingers to guide them, and uh, Rani tried to kind of free herself from it. Um, can talk to her as well, and as such, she basically kind of killed herself or killed her body. That's why her soul has to be in this doll instead. So now, from here, I'm gonna head over back to the Elden Throne, and there are two more bosses left: uh, Radagon and Elden Beast. And on Radagon, I want to show you something. So, as I do that, I might have to redo the fight really quickly. But, like I said, we have time for it. And it, it, it's pretty funny. It's, uh... Is this a crash? Might be a crash. Oh, oh, nah, we're good. Oh. Just, lane del takes a bit of time to load sometimes. And the game also likes to crash. So, like, don't be surprised that I expected for it to be crashing there. So, yeah, I'm gonna show you some, some nice piece of FromSoft coding after I get flashed. As I said before, like, I was rushing B on Dust 2. That probably, uh... Rings couple of bells to some people so I'm gonna approach Radagon immediately and he's programmed first to work towards me for a specific uh, amount of time I'm gonna get to him and then if I walk out of the corner of his vision and do not walk back into it uh, we're just kind of chilling with Radagon look at him go look at him headbang into the team that is pretty cool <laughs> so unless I get back into the range of his now uh, or, like, don't not perform an action in front of him. He's just gonna stand there like that. Uh, it got patched, but at the same time, it's pretty funny. So, the, R the L2 that I did there, the RKR, activated him. It's quite finicky to be able to activate RKR and not activate his fight. So, I'm just gonna quit out and redo it. Um, yeah, it it's pretty funny. And I'm gonna actually abuse it to my advantage right now. Yeah, another flashbang. It's just great. It's always great to see, especially if you have a late night gaming session. Thank you, Miyazaki, as always. Es especially for when you practice this boss fun. Yeah. So I can abuse this by just going to his side. And because I'm staying like right in front of him, he doesn't actually attack at all and he's dead. Then I'm going to summon the wolves. This is the 18 mine that I needed in order to do the two beams and then summon the wolves. And this is because the Elden Beast, I can actually break its AI as well, but it's random. I need the summons for it, and I need to position myself kind of specifically between his back leg, back leg, leg, and my wolves in front of him, and hopefully get the AI break. And we got it, okay, so that's really nice. So now Elden Beast is just gonna chill, and that's Elden Beast right there. Done. So this is purely like random, essentially. We don't really know exactly what it happens, but it's some kind of a glitch in its targeting system because uh, it tries to like focus on the wolves, but at the same time, oh, so that's time. There we go. And uh, here's the Giga Chad <laughs> Rani ending. Thank you, guys.
So yeah, kind of not the most intense boss fight at the end, but it can be. If, if you don't get the AR break and Elden V starts kind of flying around, it can be quite intense. So. so this is what you guys paid for, so I'll be quiet for a second. Or not, because the ending's kind of long, so I'll just talk anyways. So this is uh, Marika slash Radagon. They're like kind of one and the same. And uh, yeah, you broke the statue by winning the last fight. So now the statue needs to be mended. But obviously, I'm not Giga Chat enough to be able to do that, clearly. Damn, I messed it up real good. But yeah, this ending is uh, very visual. I, I like it quite a bit. There are basically like, what, like six endings in the game or something, or seven? But there are only three variations. The other ones are just kind of reskins of the same ending. A thousand year voyage under the wisdom of the moon. Here, this is what it looks like when you look into the James Webb telescope, by the way. This is what you see. Funny Rani thing, did it first. Funny thing about this ending is apparently it's mistranslated from Japanese to uh, English. I mean, I guess that's not really surprising. That, that like with Dark Souls, that happened a lot. And there's quite a bit to be discovered, actually, when you try to properly translate the Japanese. Uh, but obviously, that takes a lot of money and effort, usually, because you need to hire translators and stuff like that. So, yeah, it takes quite a bit of time. So obviously, Rani married Giga Chat because they both have big hats. Yeah, <laughs> I took my off though, out of respect. She wants another ring to the other hand now, but like, spent all my runes on that. <laughs> Calm down. We haven't discovered any rune duping actually just yet, uh, which is kind of interesting because you know, duping resources is actually kind of. Kind of the norm. But yeah, that's Elden Ring right there. Finished with the Rani ending. Thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you very much to my commentators. You're welcome. I hope you guys enjoyed your spot as well. I also got to touch your thighs, which is very nice. Um, but no, uh, if you're interested in Elden Ring, if you're interested in Dark Souls, if you're interested in Bloodborne speedruns, www.speedsouls.com. That's your number one source for speed. We have a Discord, 11,000 members strong. Any questions that you might have, they'll be answered there. Uh, use common sense, though. Le read the welcome channel, okay? That's that's quite uh, that would be quite appreciated. But besides that, you know, everyone is welcome. And thank you so much for checking out the run. I did this somewhat recently. If you watched my previous run at GDQ and you watched this one, you have double thanks because that means you guys enjoy it, and and that means a lot to me. Uh, obviously, big thanks to ESA for hosting another already very successful on-site event. It's always a pleasure to come back here and. And, and help support a great cause. It's not the last thing for me that you're gonna see. I actually am running Dark Souls on the night between Thursday and Friday. I haven't played Dark Souls since Elden Ring has come out, so that'll be a, that'll be a wild ride. I'll get onto the Rust thing as soon as possible. Thank you to the crowd behind me, obviously, for staying up quite late and checking out the run. I really, really appreciate that. And everyone else, uh, if you wanna see more of me, you can obviously check out my Twitch, YouTube, Catalyst Z. I make videos about speedruns and speed run myself quite a bit, so you can check that out. But that's it. Thank you so much for the donations. I believe we still have one more pending, so Nico, if you want to get it out of the way. Absolutely. We've got a $20 donation from Rafe that goes towards the Argix Cursed Sonic costume. We're actually climbing up quite far in that at the moment. I think we're just over $400. No, $488. So we're about nearly a quarter of the way towards meeting that incentive. But we are going to be bringing you over very soon to the next run. It's actually going to be the end of my host shift as well. I'll bring, be giving you over to the capable hands of Robo Sparkle as we transition into a break. Next run is going to be a big one. Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, Randomizer. We'll see you soon. Stay hydrated, stay awesome, and look after yourselves. <laughs>